will rest in the fair and happy land by and by, just across on the evergreen shores, shores in the song of Moses and the land by and by.
Evan, we're so thankful that you're here this morning to worship you and to study your word. We're so thankful for all that you've given us, our spiritual blessings, your son of Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect life and gave himself as the perfect sacrifice and took all the love that anyone could ever have in the world and gave himself and shed his blood that we might have forgiveness of our sins and have hope for eternal life. We're mindful of so many that are listed here this morning of being sick. Go home, Lord. Know that he is struggling right now. Know that he's in control. And we will see and do whatever we can to get him out. Be with Randall and be with Langham. It sounds like he's been had some, some major struggles at this point, also. Be with Benny Cunningham and his wife. We know that he's got some challenges, also. Uh, know that young Terry, Lee Loveless, and Sean have had a big uh, recovery and can hear and see that. Brother-in-law, Keith Altman, so many that were mentioned in the in announcements that we need to see for their needs and help them. We ask for your blessing of healing upon them. Be with us as we go through this service. Help us to pay attention to the word that we sing in songs and pay attention to the lesson that he brought to us. And I pray that we'll go from this place greatly built up and spiritually stronger. We pray all of these things in Christ's name. <laughs> Mark your songbooks to 519. 519 will be the song of, the song of encouragement after the lesson. <clears throat> and turn to 371. Let's all stand and sing this one when all of God's singers get home. <clears throat> we'll sing all three verses and then dismiss or uh, turn the lesson over to Brother Dale. What a song of delight in the city so bright will be watched in deep heaven's fair door. Oh, how the ransom will raise happy song in his praise when all of God's singers get home. When all
and to be able to be benefited by the time that we get to spend together today thinking about spiritual things and worshiping in spirit and in truth. One of the challenging and sometimes most difficult moments in our lives come whenever decisions have to be made. There are many times that we're faced with very complicated and difficult decisions, and the tendency is one to just kind of stick our head in the sand and hope it blows over. We don't want to be in a decision-making capacity. We don't want the responsibility for having decided that this is the way a certain thing is going to go. And so often we struggle with those moments of indecision and we just kind of don't know what to do, what's going to happen. We kind of just become victimized then by whatever is the outpouring of things. And for us to be able to truly become decision makers can become a series of what I call monumental moments. Whenever we are finally willing to say, okay, here's the facts. This is the way that I see things, and this is the way that I need to go. Even early on in life, we begin to be faced with some major decision making. Let's say that you're finishing up high school and you're trying to make some commitments as to what's going to be maybe the, the best college for your future education. What team do you want to play for maybe at a, at a college level? What's going to be the best setting and situation for me? Oftentimes there's a lot of publicity given to star athletes and the way in which they go and visit various schools, but eventually there comes a moment of decision. There comes that moment when I've got to sign my name on the line, so to speak, and say, this is the choice I've made. This is the commitment that I am going to make. And I'm going to press forward with the success of that choice. It may work for us as well as with a career choice. Where are we going to work? What kind of job do we want to have? often trying to encourage young people to think about a career, to plan toward that, and then to one day realize that career opportunity is a major challenge. Because, well, I like this, and I like this, and maybe that'd be okay, or maybe I'll do some of this. And I just start dabbling in a lot of little things, and sometimes wind up sort of spinning their wheels for a lengthy period of time never finding something that fully can support them, provide for them, provide for their families, to be the things that could help them have a successful future. It may be as well, though in human relationships, two people meet each other and they have a, an attraction for each other, they enjoy good times with each other, but then there's that decision of popping the questions, as we used to say. You know, and are we going to make a commitment here, a lifelong commitment to a relationship that will be in place until we die? And there are many individuals who shy away from the commitment part of that. Yeah, they enjoy having good times with other people. But whenever it comes to the point of saying, will you marry me and will we be together all through the years? No, 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 no I'm not so sure about that. And so individuals oftentimes torpedo their own happiness because they can't make a decision and they can't commit to that decision and see it through to success. Well, the Bible gives us a lot of examples of individuals who faced a very important crossroads in life. And as a result of the moment and where they found themselves, it became a very major issue for them in trying to determine what they're going to do with their lives and how am I going to react in the next little bit. One example of that comes to us from Esther chapter four. 
And here we can talk about a Mordecai moment for just a minute. Mordecai was an uncle to Esther, and Esther had become the queen. She was in a position of some degree of influence and power. But because of Haman's anger and hatred toward Mordecai, he had decided that he wanted to sort of go secretively and get the king's permission to have this nation of people extinguished that were offensive to him, and he made up other charges to go with that, and succeeded in getting the king to sign a decree that would have allowed the Jews to be exterminated throughout the kingdom. Now, what are you going to do with that? Are we just going to wring our hands and be the victims and just hope that maybe we can hide or somehow evade that eventual moment? Some would. But Mordecai realized that Esther was influential. And this was a time for bravery and courage. This was not a time to be timid. It was not a time to hide. So Mordecai could have just passed over this and said, well, we'll wait and see what happens. No, he became much more proactive than that. And he gets in touch with Esther. And in Esther chapter 4, beginning in verse 13, it says that Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all of the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arrive to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Esther could step forward here, and she did, and winds up being the one to change the course of history. To be the one that got the king to reconsider the edict that had been passed, she exposed the actions of Haman and the wickedness that he had in store, and why. And as a result of some folks deciding that something needed to be done, Mordecai gave counsel to Esther. Esther found the courage that she needed. And she had explained it to Mordecai that if I go in to see the king unannounced, it could cost me my life. But she found the courage to do it anyway. Because she said, I don't know what may come from this. But I've got to try. A lot of times that's where we are in decision making. We're not going to know where the outcome is really going to fall. But we pray hard for God's blessing upon the decision that we've made, if we believe it to be a godly and righteous decision. And we're going to do our best to see it through. And we pray for God's blessing and we pray for success. But also we can temper that prayer with the thought that if this is not your will, then don't let it work out, but give me the wisdom to see what course of action I should follow next. Do not just send me into the axis of defeat where I feel like, well, this didn't work out, and now I'm just trash, and I haven't got good sense, and I've got, and where we just beat ourselves up with all kinds of incriminations about supposedly how terrible we are. When God said no to that request, I've got something better in mind. A lot of times we don't see that correlation. And if we fail at something, it's as though, oh, this is the end of the world and it's never going to have any, any bright moments and things are never going to turn around. These monumental, monumental moments come as we've made a decision. We push forward with that decision, praying for God's blessing and help in what we are doing. And we see where it goes. We know from Romans chapter 8, verse 28, that all things work together for good. Maybe my perspective isn't right on this. Maybe there's another course of action that's a better one to follow. And if so, God help me see that. But I think we find in Mordecai's situation, he didn't just sit and wait to see what God was going to do and hope that God was going to take complete control. As he tells Esther, 
He said, if you don't do what you're capable of doing with the opportunity afforded you, God's still going to take care of his people. <laughs> Salvation will come from another source. But God's going to be vengeful toward you if you don't try. If you don't step forward to do what you are capable of doing. So Mordecai was a man of strong conviction. We find that whenever he would not bow to Haman. He remained faithful to his confidence in God. And so he was not easily intimidated. And then whenever this edict was signed, which he knew was aimed at him personally, but was also going to destroy far more, he did not run. He did not hide from the opportunity. He realized with God's help, victory was at hand, and he pressed on through. What a monumental moment. Because as a result of his courage and of his prompting, Esther went ahead and offered to, to, uh, uh, to the king. Esther offered an alternative, exposed the situation, and through her efforts, salvation came to her people. So it's important that we understand decision making and realize the courage sometimes that it takes to make that kind of decision. We might talk about another moment that the Bible talks about that was critical, and that was in the life of Daniel. Whenever we go over to Daniel chapter 6, we find that Daniel is put in a very awkward situation. You know, he has found great favor with the king. He has been blessed in, in many ways, and good has come to him and to his friends because of the wisdom that God had given them the executive abilities that they had, their administrative abilities in the kingdom. And there were others at the court that were horribly jealous of what Daniel had been blessed to be able to do. And sometimes we find that in life. That as we strive to simply do what's right and do it with all of our energies, there are going to be others who would like to see that undermined. There are others who would like to find some way to see us lose out. It just happens that way sometimes. There are those kinds of persecutions that we endure. And so Daniel finds out that a law has been signed saying that you can't pray to God, to any other, any other deity, other than to show homage to the king for the next 30 days or so. But Daniel decided he was going to continue to do what he'd always done. He was going to do what was, he knew was right in the sight of God, and God would handle the details. So in Daniel chapter 6, going down to verse 10, it says, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Daniel made the decision that I'm going to be remaining faithful to my convictions. I'm going to keep on doing what I've been doing in serving God. Others may not like it. Others may afflict me because of it. But Daniel made the decision to do what was right regardless of what consequences may follow. And so then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Aha, uh -huh, we've got him. And so, of course, we know more of the rest of the story, how they took the story to the king, that these men had made it a formalized signing of a law so it could not be repealed, and so Daniel wound up with the trip to the lion's den. But as we look to what happens here, God spared him, and he was victorious even in doing what was right. And so the king spends a fretful, sleepless night worrying about Daniel and worrying about his welfare. He didn't want to see this kind of thing happen to such a good man, but he'd been kind of entrapped in this situation, and the piece of law that he'd signed had an edge to it that he was not aware of. 
Well, then we find in verse 23, whenever he goes the next morning to check on Daniel, how happy he is to find out that God had seen to it that Daniel was spared. It says, and then in verse 23, when the king was exceeding glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no manner of hurt was found upon him, because he believed in his God. Here we see another critical component in these monumental moments. We've got to have the trust that God can take care of things, and that God's going to help us be successful in doing what is right. Daniel knew that praying to God was the right thing to do, and no law of man was going to stop him from doing that. And yes, there were unpleasant consequences on this occasion. It would have been somewhat fearful to realize you're getting ready to be thrown to some lions and quite possibly torn in pieces. But so be it. He was right with his God. And so off to that sentencing he went. Other occasions we could find in the book of, of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the same kind of thing. They said, we know that God could save us if he was of a mind too. But even if he allows us to perish, that's okay too. Because they knew that what they were doing was right in God's sight and he would take care of them both in this life and in the life to come. You see here what is the enemy of these monumental moments? The thing that tends to make us go into neutral, become indecisive, and want to run away from obligation is the concept of fear. Whenever we are consumed with fear of, oh, what might happen, what might be the consequence here is when we want to avoid these major decision-making moments. It's when we want to run the other way. And so what we've got to tighten up on is our trust in God. That with Him, things will work out in a manner well-pleasing unto Him. And we're going to have to trust that we're going to be taken care of both in this life and in the life to come. The issue gets down to our lack of faith sometimes. The idea that somehow God's going to dangle us out here on the end and he's going to drop us. And calamity's going to fall and God's not going to care. Satan wants to implant as many of those seeds of doubt and fear as he possibly can. Because seeing committed people Persistently doing what's right, even in light of threat and possibly bad circumstances, is something that, that Satan can't handle. James tells us if we resist the devil, he's the one that's going to flee. But we've got to have the courage to be able to make the decisions and stand fast upon God's word. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, we find another monumental moment. And here, King Jehoshaphat has the major reckoning to do. Because as a king, he had tried in large measure to do what was right there in the nation of Judah. But that did not insulate him from all the possible problems that might come. And sure enough, an alliance of adversaries came together in verse 1 of 2 Chronicles chapter 20. It came to pass this also, that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon, and with them other besides the Ammonites, came against Jehoshaphat to battle. And then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side of Syria. And behold, they be in uh, Haragon. Tamar, which is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim the fast throughout all of Judah. This was a massive army. A major collection of adversaries. In terms of logistics, Jehoshaphat did not have an army that could withstand 
a horse like this. From human reasoning, Jehoshaphat said, we're doomed. There's no way that we can win. The nation is going to be destroyed by all of these heathens who want to see our downfall. Realizing his limitations. He didn't go running off to try and put together an alliance with Egypt or to find some other secret weapon that was going to allow him victory. He went to his God. He knew that God was going to have to be the author of their salvation. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Here we see the key. Later on, as we've been talking about in our Wednesday night study, we see what eventually happened to, to Judah and to the northern tribes as well, when they forgot that God could be their protector. And when they turned to every other source for salvation based upon their own human wis wisdom and reasoning, instead of saying, God is the one I will trust in, God will make this work. So Judah comes together to consider what God can do. And Jehoshaphat stood the congregation, the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. And we find here the prayer that he offers to God in their behalf. He acknowledges the things that they've done that, that they're not perfect in God's sight. But what's going to happen now? He said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven and rulest not over the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thy hand there is not power and might so that none is able to withstand thee. He said, you're the one with all the power. God, you can handle this. This is what comes out of all these monumental moments. Sometimes we feel as though it's all about me. It's all about my decision making. It's all about my wisdom. And how can I figure out a way to fix this? Well, maybe you can't. But God can and God is saying, I'll do the work, but you've got to show me that you trust me. He says, Art not thou our God, who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and gave it to the seed of Abraham thy friend forever? And they dwelt therein, and have built thee a sanctuary therein for thy name, saying that if when evil cometh upon us as a sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we stand before this house in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, and then thou wilt hear and help. And now behold, the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom thou wouldest not let Israel invade, when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Behold, I say, how they, shall, how they reward us to come and cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given us to inherit. O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us, neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. Lord, I have not an answer on this. I, I don't know what to do, but I trust that you do. It's in your hands. Whenever we start dealing with these decision-making moments, that's also a very wise decision. When we have opportunity, we need to be able to exercise those opportunities that carries with it a sense of responsibility to do what we can in service unto God. But sometimes the problem may be more complicated than what our little minds can sort out. And Lord, I'm doing my best, but I don't know what to do. And Lord, it's up to you. And as we continue looking at the story, God did fix things. We find that he allowed these nations to turn on each other and before the battle was ever fought. And whenever they went out to meet them, Jehoshaphat didn't send an army out there leading with swords and spears. The lead guard of his army was a chorus of singers that went out singing praise unto God. And we find that whenever they came forward to see what happened in verse 22, and when they began to sing and to praise the Lord, when 
10, to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. When the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, utterly to slay and to destroy them. And when they had made an end to the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy one another. And when Judah came forward, the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked into the multitude, and behold, they were dead bodies, fallen to the earth, and none escaped. And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoil of them, they found among them in abundance both riches with the dead bodies and precious jewels, which they stripped off for themselves more than they could carry away. And they were three days in gathering of the spoil. It was so much. And then the next day, there was praise and rejoicing to God for the deliverance that he had provided. Look at this. Here he had no idea what to do. But he said, Lord, our eyes are on you. And God came through. We're going to be faced with all kinds of circumstances that we've got to analyze. And we may have some things that we can effectively do. Sometimes we may feel like we're in over our heads and we don't know what to do. But God is always going to be there for us to trust. He's the one that can come up with the solution. And instead of us being overcome with fear, trying to dodge responsibility, trying to avoid decision making, let's just see what God can do. All too often, we far shortchange God as to what he has the power and the willingness to do. And the question is for us in our own lives, what's your monumental moment? I'm sure all of us are facing some major decisions. What's the course? What do I need to do? It may be that we look at many of the cases we've talked about that are dealing with health issues. What's the best treatment option? We find the information that's available and we make a decision as to what we can do. Maybe it's a commitment of some sort. Are we going to sign that contract? Are we going to take that job? Are we going to go to that school? Are we going to get married? Are we going to do whatever? We reach that point of decision making. But looking at the uncertain times that are ahead, we may be faced with all kinds of decision making like we've never faced before. But in that decision making process, our trust has got to remain in the Lord. That we're going to do what's right, whatever the challenge may be. We're going to pray as we ought. We're going to have the courage to do as we should. We'll sing praises to our God and trust Him that things are going to work out right. But how about maybe the most important one of all? For many of us even here this morning. How about that monumental moment when you decide it's time to give your life to Jesus? It's time to obey the gospel of Christ. It's time to not linger in indecision, not allow negative thoughts and experiences to so color our thinking that we keep stomping through life doing things our way, knowing full well on the day of judgment will be condemned because of the refusal to decide to obey him. You know, King David went through a whole lot as he dealt with fleeing from King Saul, all of the efforts that were put forth to unseat him whenever he took over as king. There were so many who wanted to see what was going to, to happen to David. They wanted him to fail because Saul, they knew, had been anointed king, and now Saul was dead. He'd been killed by the Philistines, and David was leading them, and, and there were some who were avowed enemies of David. But notice David's focus over in 2 Samuel chapter 22, beginning in verse 1. 
David spake unto the Lord the words of this song. In the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all of his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. And he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. The God of my rock, in him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge, my Savior. Thou savest me from violence. I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. When the waves of death compassed me and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid, the sorrows of hell compassed me about, the snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and I cried to my God and he did hear my voice out of his temple and my cry did enter into his ears. David said, I survived all the decision making and all the challenges I had to face. Because God was with me. Jehoshaphat survived his battle, and the enemies were destroyed by the hand of the Lord, because the Lord was the one who fought the battle and gave them deliverance. He's going to be there for us, regardless of what we face. We face all kinds of trials. That's why the 23rd Psalm is so comforting. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He's the one that leads us to green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He goes on to say, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. That's what allows us make those monumental decisions, those important decisions of serving God, being faithful to Him, and doing the best we can with every decision that we have to make in this life that God can be glorified. If it's time for you to get on board with God, to decide to serve Him, this could be the monumental moment for you even. To put off the delays, put off the excuses, and say, I will come to you. And we urge you to come, as together we sing and have this. Oh, will you now, oh, will you now from sign and sea, oh, oh, will you see the path of peace? The path of peace. Give Christ your heart. Give Christ your heart. Make him your goal. Let Jesus dwell within your soul. Within your soul. Let Jesus dwell. Let Jesus dwell. Within your soul. Let Jesus dwell. Within your soul. Let joys increase. As ages roll, let Jesus dwell. Let Jesus dwell within your soul, within your soul. For sinners here, for sinners here, His voice of love, His voice of love is calling you, is calling you to heaven above, to heaven above. Give Him your heart, give Him your heart. Jesus dwell within your soul, within your soul. Let Jesus dwell within your soul. Within your soul, let Jesus dwell within your soul. Let joys increase. Let joys increase. As it is roll. Let Jesus dwell within your soul, within your soul. And when the hour, and when the hour of death draws near, of death draws near trust him today, trust him today, a way of fear, a way of fear, the joys of hell, the joys of hell will soon unfold, will soon Let Jesus dwell within your soul. Let Jesus dwell within your soul. Let 
Jesus dwells within your soul. Within your soul, let Jesus dwell. Let Jesus dwell. Within your soul. Within your soul. Let joys increase. Let joys increase. As angels roll. As angels roll. Let Jesus dwell. Let Jesus dwell within your soul. Song books to number nine. We'll sing all three verses, one, two, and three of true worship, and then we'll sing the chorus. Off we come together. Off we sing and pray. Jason. Oh, 
also to talk to lay vine stores within property. We have baskets around the auditorium to do that. I want to thank everyone for being here this morning. We want to pray for those that are sick and not able to be with us, those on our sick list. Then we keep them in a prayer. Anything else that needs to be announced? Anything at this time? Not after song, well, that's uh, Brother David. Everyone sing, stand and Turn to 176. Standing on the promises. Mm-hmm. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises. Standing on the promises. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing on the promises. Standing on the promises. I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen.